Um, Edward Carpenter, who's oh so trendy now, um, he was the original hipster with his long beard, his homespun clothes, his vegetarianism, his intersexness. He was so groovy that his sandals have been preserved for the nation. Um, <laughs> He had Walt Whitman and the Bhagavad Gita as the two most important influences of his life. And he said about the years from 1881 onwards, it was a fantastic and enthusiastic period. The socialist and anarchist propaganda, the feminist and suffragist upheaval, the huge trade union growth in the theosophic movement, the new currents in the theatrical, musical and artistic world, the torrent of even of change in the religious world, all constituted so many streams and headwaters, converging, as it were, into a great river. And I think this shows that the energy, the fellowship, and above all the hope <coughs> in the success of the desire for change, to which our increasingly literate population was beginning to aspire, really. Anna Kingsford reigned over this London Lodge of the Theosophical Society, for just a couple of years, really, but she left a big imprint upon it. And she was fearless. She was heroic. She was a great achiever, incredibly self-confident, and greatly superior to fairly much everybody that she ever met in her own eyes. And she had a bit of a messianic mentality and a narcissistic personality. So how could she fail? I wonder if that pops up in any of the horoscopes that Kim's just been talking about. <clears throat> She'd seen the establishment of the Salvation Army, where the decent Christians went back to helping people, uh, as well as spreading the word of the Lord. William and Catherine Booth did that, <clears throat> and had been since 1865 when she was 19. She would have been very well aware of them, because people with money tend to have an eye out for things locally, and they like to patronise if possible quite often. Um, when she was 24, the promulgation of the papal infallibility caused quite a stir, and she converted to Roman Catholicism two years later. She'd had various visitations from Mary Magdalene. <coughs> Excuse me. And thank you. And became baptised in that name. Her poor passive cousin, husband, um, coped with the embarrassment that he may have felt from his parishioners, the same way that he dealt with every... Uh, he, he dealt with the virtually sole upbringing of their daughter. He just went along with her. Anna was unstoppable. If she had to be in her, her smart bonnet, then that was it. There was no getting it out. He had no choice and he knew there was no talking to her once she had a burning idea. Then came her passion for the Married Women's Property Act, which did indeed need reform. And she was very, very good because he didn't seem to have much money. When she took up with Maitland, he'd lost his money, basically. He had enough to live in not genteel poverty, rather more than that. But he didn't have that much spare cash. And so for the 20 odd years that they were together, it's presumable that to some extent she kept him. That he would have kept his pride, but she was able to finance their travels variously. Then came her passion for the Married Women's Property Act, as I say. Um, and through that, she met some of the uh, people who went on into the uh, spiritualist and anti-vivisection movements. It was a terrible act, really, because if a man got married at all and the woman had money, he just had to say, just go to court and say the woman's insane. And she would be put in a lunatic asylum for the rest of her life and never see her children or her money or her dissolute husband ever again. And it's unbelievable to us now, but it's not that far away in our social history, really. <clears throat> And the next big fad in her life, as I say, was spiritualism. Um, then she had the fury at not being able to be trained to be a, a, a doctor over here. She was ambitious, she was furious with the vivisectionists and wanted to prove them wrong. She destroyed her health by travelling to study, but she never weakened and she got her qualifications. That was no mean feat for any woman of, of the time, obviously, but when you consider that the most of her body was badly tubercular, and that she was, you know, chloroformed up to the eyes. She really did struggle for the majority of her 30s um, she, to, to have got up out of bed and done anything, let alone take on big, big, big causes, was really quite an impressive thing. She also had visions, and Hildegard von Bingen, the great visionary and healer, um, gives us insights into the world of the visionary. Some people say now that her blinding lights were migraines, but there was more to it than that. There was so much to her migraines that the Pope 
said, tell me what you get and we will act on it. So in 1141, when she was 42, Hildegard said, a blinding light of exceptional brilliance flowed through my entire brain. And so it kindled my whole heart and breast like, like a flame, not burning, but warming. And suddenly I understood the meaning of the explosions of the books, that, it, it, that is to say of the Psalter, the Evangelist, and other Catholic books in the Old or New Testaments. At the same time, she received the command, O oh, fragile one, ash of ash and corruption of corruption, say and write what you see and what you hear. So there might be no mistaking the, of the directive to write down, to publicise what she understood from her visions. It was repeated three more times in similar terms. So the, the repetitive nature of, of recurring dreams, of these things that nag at us, it, it's, it's marvellous to see it written down so very, very early. Anna's vision showed her how people could and should live in the afterlife and she became convinced that the Christian church needn't rely on the clergy or the traditions so much. They were, of course, misinterpreting the Bible as well, but don't worry, she would set them straight on that track too in time or indeed show them the perfect way. In pregnancy, um, she made it very clear that she had no desire to have the child she was carrying. She was completely disinterested in it. And that maintained, once she'd had the child, it was a case of take it away from me. She had a guinea pig that she loved far, 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 far more. And she really had almost nothing to do with poor little Edith. At least she was honest about it. Um, and now we all know people who far prefer cats and dogs to humans. We think, you know, that's no bad thing. But then she hadn't had a choice of uh, becoming pregnant, really, because my generation of occultists used to laugh at her. We used to say, ooh, Anna Kingsford. She had sex on her, on her wedding night, got pregnant, never had sex again, and all the poor husband had to show for it was an asthmatic wife who had the vapours. So we had very little respect <laughs> for her at all. <clears throat> It's quite possible that, you know, from what we've heard this morning, that she believed in you could have a happy, non-penetrative sex life with someone, and maybe, you know, up underneath the bustle, nobody saw anything. Who knows how active her sex life was, but she was so sick, she would have had a great difficulty in having an, an active sex life anyway, I think, really. But she had no love or empathy at all for her daughter. Um, and honestly, you know, there are complex reasons for this, but they, they can be because animals don't judge people, because the human is in charge, and, and at, least, um, of at least the well-being and happiness of the, of the animals, that dogs and cats are fairly self-sufficient and can be dealt with easily if they misbehave. All things you can't do to people very well, really. Another aspect is the narcissistic personality rather likes the way there's very little intimacy involved with animals in the same way that humans require it. And she seems to fit that well-corseted, straight-laced, I'm not going there attitude with, with all these sorts of things. <clears throat> and she now had lots of, re lots of reasons for wanting to dominate situations. She was clever and she fought hard to find uses for intelligence and to be publicly recognised. She was pretty and very well dressed, in sharp contrast to the anti-vivisectionists and other, other various older theosophists. There are still shortages of women leaders in all walks of life and then the vegetarian movement was in its infancy, infancy, but it made a very loud noise and she was a part of that. Whatever she did, she wanted her voice heard. She spearheaded lots of things and she was prepared to be known for it, which a lot of people just beaver away and they do the typing and get stuff to the printers. She wasn't absolutely not interested in that. She wanted to, her name known and thought that within the circle she dealt, she lived, that they should all be listening to what she had to say. And a lot of them were very receptive to it, but she was the one who dragged them along and got the money out of them to some extent. <clears throat> it grew steadily, and the, the vegetarian movement grew steadily. And 30 years after her death, there were, um, more, vegeta there were more vegetarian cafes and restaurants in London than there are now. It was a huge, huge, huge movement. And you can see how people were tenderised. They were so close to death all the time. You know, we, we don't know people who have, you know, loads of children and four of them are dead, you know, and a tubercular husband and, you know, somebody gone off to war and all the rest of it. 
the, 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 you know, the funeral business was very, very, very big business because it was all around the whole time. We don't have that comprehension. We don't have that deep sorrow. We have our personal sorrows, but we don't have a collective street-wide sorrow. We don't know our neighbours. We don't know the, you know, the people we, don't, we work with. It's not the same as people working in the factories and things. There isn't that intimacy about people's lives anymore. <clears throat> so, as I say, vegetarianism was cheap and it was a good thing. It was healthy and it fitted into this whole new world that people wanted. In the anti-vivisection movement, again, there was a great passion involved and women dominated that stage too. Elena Blavatsky was a woman who detached herself from her starter marriage that she'd em embarked on when she was a know-it-all teenager to become a world traveller, unchaperoned and constantly in the comp company of male companions. It was Maitland's 20-year age gap, our 22-year age gap, that I think entire and enabled them to travel together because he was the respectable widower. She was the poor, sick young woman. That, so we will never know the degree of intimacy within their lives, but to go unchaperoned with, with a man was still reasonably rare unless there was a, a very solid social story to say. You know, she says that, you know, if, if people thought that he was my uncle, then we didn't disabuse them. They just let it be. But they lived very, very, very closely together. And because of that, she was able to go to Paris with him to study medicine. And she left her daughter to her husband to bring up. Um, she fed off Maitland in lots of ways because he was completely devoted to her. And I think, as I say, it was partly economic that he really didn't have an awful lot of choice. And she was charismatic and she gave him a reason for living to some extent. We don't hear about his own child. Why, why wasn't he at home with him to some extent? But he, he, she, they just made one of those deep, deep connections anyway. And I think it's, you know, like... People now have decided that Pamela Coleman Smith, who made the Rider Weight pack, people have nominated her as a lesbian. There's absolutely no proof of that at all. But it's trendy to think she probably was because she didn't get married and she flat shared with someone. It's so easy for us to get it wrong. So, um, Yeah, this fed her glorified self, him being devoted to her, fed her glorified self-image. And other than him dying and presumably leaving everything to her, she would not have had any of the abandonment issues that such people have cropping up too often. Blavatsky was hailed as a mysterious, mythical, magical, mystical woman, all too human and deeply esoteric, but always powerful, always to be listened to, always to be thrilled by being in her charismatic presence. Who wouldn't want to be the next Blavatsky? She was conveniently away most of the time. The favoured few could meet her in Paris every now and again, but really she wasn't accessible to the uh, TS members. Annie Besson was a very political firebrand who published with her lover Charles Bradlaugh a book on birth control. They were tried for it. They didn't go to jail on a technicality, but the trial cost her... Her, her children and her estranged husband was given permanent control of, of uh, Mabel, famously, I think. Um, she was about 18 months younger than Anna Kingsford, but every cause she supported was well reported on, so they would have been very aware of each other. Janet Oppenheim in The Other World of 1985 makes an interesting point that both women sought religious it fulfilment as sincerely as the political or social influence, yet it is precisely the religious mantle assumed after gaming provenance in the world of men, which both Kingsford and Besson and apparently believed gave them greater authority than any of the others that they had done during their full and varied lives. Because it was a smaller world, it was a more of, geographically, it was lay, largely based within London, it was a more contained world to that extent, but they had both really been battlers. And um, the TS they then just thought was the most important place that they had any influence. So how did it happen that she became Mrs. President? Uh, Charles Massey took it upon himself to appoint her. HPB wrote about Massey, presumably in July 1883, when they had just 
uh, joined, they had just joined, she and Maitland had just joined the society. All Mr. Massey's doings, was it not he and he alone who proposed and had her elected as the only possible saviour for the, the um, British Theosophical Society? Well now, thank him and keep her to turn you all into jelly. Of course, she will wag you all as her tail more than ever. I know it will end in scandal. Well, Olcott is coming and then you will have Nolan's Volans, like it or not, to accept the decision of a nominal president. My boss gave him instructions and hurries him on. Yours, but not Mrs Kingsford's, HPB. <laughs> Next, she said, remember that hitherto no one in the London Lodge has done anything for theosophy unless you consider it the greatest honour for having joined it. Remember that Mrs. K does not believe, and if she believes, she does not care one fig for the brothers. Blavatsky's letters are brilliant. She's like an evening, she's like an evening in a wine bar with a mate, where she digs up all the dirt, she says terrible, terrible things to people, because when she met Kingsford, she had to be, oh yes, I'm so pleased, yes, so lovely. And really, she goes, God, will she ever leave? There was a conversation held by Mr and Mrs Sinnott and HPB said of it by August 1883 this, they, they hadn't been in the society long they'd already drawn up battle lines between Maitland and Kingsford and Sinnott and Subaru and the others. Why did you invite so many people, to, malignant critics and fools? You had 63 people interested this is difficult because Blavatsky's Punctuation is not our punctuation. Her sentence structure isn't always our strength sentence structure. And then other times she has bits of slang and you think you've, you can really ride with it. So, as I say, this is their little soiree that they had. Why did you invite so many malignant critics and fools? You had 63 people interested theosophists with you, vegetarians with Mrs. K and spiritualists, some with you both, and more or less friendly, and the rest, more than four times that number were all black enemies or sneering, dissimulating hypocrites. And the ladies, well, they were so undressed. No one over here in India could look at them. Only Mrs. Sinnott was OK, and next to her, Mrs. K. Say, why was she dressed in a dress that looked like the black and yellow coat of the zebras in the menagerie of the Raja of Kashmir? And is it true she had roses in her hair which is like a flaming sunset, yellow gold, and why, mercy on us, did she have her hands and arms painted black, jet black, up to the elbows for? Or was it gloves? And then, is it true that she had that night on a brilliant metal pocket in front of her with clasps and bells and something else? and crescent moon, tinkling earrings, symbolical of the growing brilliance of the London Lodge. This moon has borrowed light from the satellite, because it was so bright. HPB goes on about more serious matters for a while, and then she gets diverted back into nagging about Anna Kingsford. But why, why had she, the mystic of the century, so much jewellery on her? How can she confabulate with the unseen gods when she looks like a Delhi English jeweller's front window? <laughs> well, I too think I saw her and would like to have her portrait to compare, for she was shown to me. Is she not tall, rather, thin in the waist but broad in the shoulders and very fair? and slightly rosy cheeks and with very red lips and a nose rather longer or thicker when she speaks than when she is at rest. I don't know. Is it common to all of us? I just don't know. <laughs> her eyes bright blue. She is fascinating. But then, why make up her beautiful hair to look like the mitre of a dupa dash to a llama? <laughs> well, all this is bosh. I'm sad to death. You do not care for joking. The London Lodge ought to have been called the criticising TS. Very easy to criticise. In another letter she says, what do I care if the whole of, Lon of London goes to the Himalaya and from there slides down to Tibet? And now Ward complains to you, you blow me up, and Mrs K, at long last, writes to KH and KH complains to M and it all falls back on my head. So... Well, the real reason was because it was nothing to do with Massey or the London mob at all. It's, she says in 
December 83. That Mrs Kingsford should remain, wrote Coote Humi to Sinnet and to the London Lodge as a whole, because it was the express wish of the Kohan himself. Mrs Kingsford's election is not a matter of personal feeling, nor is it a matter of the slightest consequence whether the gifted president of the London Lodge of the Theosophical Society entertains feelings of reverence or disrespect towards the humble and known, unknown individuals at the head of the Tibetan good law, or the writer of the present, or any of his brothers. Hermetic philosophy is universal and unsectarian, while the Tibetan school will forever be regarded by those who know little, if anything of it, as coloured more or less with sectarianism. The following... <coughs> Hold on. The former, knowing neither caste nor creed nor colour, no lover of esoteric wisdom, can have any objection to the name. The Egyptian Hierophant, the Chaldean Mage, the Arhat, the Rishi, were bound in days of yore on the same voyage of discovery and ultimately arrived at the same goal through by different tracks. There are even in the present moment three centres of the occult brotherhood in existence, widely separated geographically and wildly exoterically. The true esoteric doctrine being identical in substance through differing in, though differing in terms. Mr Sinnett and Mrs Kingsford are both useful both needed by our reverend Chohan, revered Chohan and Master, but both cannot be presidents. Mrs. Kingsford views, by reason of their association with the names and symbols familiar to Christian ears and eyes, Mrs. K is more adapted to leave the movement successfully in England. Her constant and not altogether unsuccessful strife in the cause of anti-vivisection and her staunch advocacy of vegetarianism are alone sufficient to entitle her to consideration of our Chohans. Hence, our Maha Chohans preference in this direction. Well, bitch as you may, children, have your playground fights. The decision was made long before anybody in London knew anything at all about it. They'd spotted her, they'd picked her, they wanted her. <coughs> Years later, they didn't want Blavatsky because she and Bradlaw had put an ad for birth control in one of the theosophical magazines and they were in hysterics, the poor guys in the Himalayas. How dare they? What a terrible thing. We don't approve of that at all. No, 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 no. That's interfering with karma and all sorts of stuff. Can't do that. I, mean, I suspect they've had to back down on that one over the years. <clears throat> Charles Massey was the man on the ground here in London and it was him who approached Kingsford and Maitland. He was the son of a min the Minister of Finance of Verinda in the 1860s, he, he was, and the father was also the Under Secretary for State and a Liberal MP. Charles was involved with the Society of Psychical Research from its beginnings, involved with the Staint and Moses and Spiritualism through the British National Association of Spiritualists and also the Ghost Club. He was a founder member of the TS, but all of that, which still left some time for his day job, which was as a solicitor. He had a lifelong friendship with Colonel Olcott and was mentioned 20 times in the Mahatma letters. An ideal man to make such a decision, except the Blavatsky and the Masters were very dismissive of him indeed, saying that he was no use of a chela, he was too weak in temperament. <coughs> so they said... What else did they say? Sorry, I've lost my own notes here. Yeah, and the publicity about the um, phenomenon to do with the Theosophical Society, he uh, leaked outside the, t the TS and he, um, Massey said that it cost him his practice as a solicitor. It's unlikely that that was the sole cause, if the masters are correct, and they usually were, that with all, he is the noblest, purest, in short, one of the best men I know, although occasionally too trusting in the wrong directions. But he lacks entirely correct intuition. He resigned as president of the London Lodge at the beginning of 1883, and a year later, Master Kuthumi wrote expressing great concern about him to Sinnet. His mind is closed with black doubt, and his psychological state is pitiable. Poor, poor, deluded man. His depression was deep and Anna Kingsford and Edward Maitland may well have helped him as their acceptance of president and vice president took all that pressure off him um, within the lodge. So while the society hadn't got any existing members to assume the role, um, 
that they did is, is very concerning, actually, because they didn't belong to the society. They were parachuted in. Massey approached them, and they said, yeah, terrific. A whole raft of new people, an established structure. We'll have some of that. Yes, please. He also agreed with Kingsford about the Sinnott's esoteric Buddhism, not coming from the masters, but from Sinnott himself. Essentially, Sinnott made no references at all to where he'd got the information from. Unlike his occult world, which was full of references. So, Massey published the metaphysical basis of esoteric Buddhism. And this is a 70-page deconstruction of the work of the eminent and pioneering and very well-connected theosophical leadership. Coolly, calmly, and in a very informed and well-rounded way, he took them down. Massey really knew his theosophy. He was quite entitled to deconstruct the metaphysical basis of esoteric Buddhism by Sinnott, and he was very capable of doing so. His scholarship was broad, and his interpretations of every point were as valid as Sinnott or Subaru. They had obviously resented his daring to question them, but they presumably resented the exposure of their origin of the ideas they, that they presented as being their own, not really via the hidden masters. As well they might as it potentially lessened their status in the eyes of the very new London Lodge and the existing members of the society. This was the leadership that the, um, Kingsford was attacking. She, took, she, she too wrote a letter, which is basically a pamphlet of about 30 pages, and she, she couches it all terribly carefully. In, you know, I, I would hate to deceive, but I was really perplexed by, and it seems, it was, I'm new to this, but it seems incredulous to me that. And she was so sweet and so polite, so she smashed him for seven pages, and then she went on to saying, well, if you follow my Christian esoteric way, you'll do well, you know. It's really all right. To have opened the TS in the West in New York and then to have established it in the East so firmly and then have it migrate to London within seven years was impressive. The beginning years of most societies, not just any esoteric ones by any manner of means, are almost necessarily bumpy as people vie for their faction to gain dominance, really. And it's where you're fighting out what is important and what isn't important. And it's very sensible, but... They, they are the years of the passionately held views as well. When things are new, it, it really matters to you. And the fractious attitudes deter as many people of worth who would like to join any society as those that don't, really. It, it, puts people, it puts more people off than it attracts. We see it now. Name any organisation from the scouts up and down the scale. It's the same thing. Factionalism is terribly, terribly difficult. Ripping up dirty laundry in public is unseemly. An ego, um, an ego driven as everybody would deny. Theosophy was so radical in its outlook, so very brave in shouting loudly and often of the validity of the Eastern religions that it's hard for us to comprehend. Queen Victoria was Empress of India, she ruled a quarter of the earth, she was making enormous amounts of money out of India. The army and the merchants had been there for a long established for a very long time. They were nominally Christians, but really didn't believe much of that, and they certainly had no time or respect for any alternative religious beliefs. That was deeply wounding to people like Blavatsky, because they, the theosophists saw the validity of these religions that were thousands of years old, and they had a god or a goddess or a, an idea or a way of coping with every situation that you could possibly think of in several worlds. And the, the British just you know, weren't interested and just sort of stomped all over it, really. And that neither were they, the British famous for their respect of the natives in any country they dominated. Blavatsky, Olcott and Ledbetter, not being European in thought, word or deed, were unhampered by such um, thoughts. Their lack of appreciation and seemingly appreciation um, and seemingly appreciation of the familiar names and esoteric movements of the previous couple of hundred years shows them very clearly in their books. They, they weren't interested in the Enlightenment. They had barely any consciousness of it. If you read the, the stuff, it, it's just not, simply not there. Simply not there. America in the 1870s would have had very few libraries that had significant collections of Enlightenment materials, and the three theosophists established a world inside the society with barely any reference to them. 
Alfred Sinnott was in India when he was in his late 30s as the editor of The Pioneer, which was the leading English language newspaper. To have got that high up the career ladder was a great achievement. And when he met HPB, she stayed with the Sinnots for six weeks in Simla. During that time, great deep friendships are formed. And in this case, they, what, the, the friendships lasted for their lifetimes. Other times, fissures will appear and they can't really be wallpapered over. You know, the old saying of, you know, fish and guests stink after three days. It's, uh, uh, you know, if somebody's staying with you for six weeks, even with servants helping out, you can either get on each other's nerves or you're bonded for life, really. So, like so many Victorians of the chattering classes, he had an interest in spiritualism and mesmerism, and they were, were used to apports. Some even had expectations of them. So many had appeared in the great uh, public interest with the great public interest of mesmerism and psychic phenomenon, both here in the States and Europe. Mesmerism was much more than the parlour game that is even now presumed to be. There, there are some jokey, half-hearted mesmeric groups creeping up now, but they're not really think it's, thinking it's valid, whereas I actually think there's a lot to be said for mesmerism. Um, and spirit healing was almost expected. Superphysical science is where clairvoyance, clairaudience and the inexplicable phenomenon were parked while they were examined with due ponderousness. Subaru was the other person that they, Kingsford and Maitland, really irritated um, because he had worked with Sinnott. They were very much, again, locked in with HPB and, and the Hidden Masters. He was a well-connected Hindu with a, um, a great and very successful interest in the law until he met HPB and Colonel Alcott and underwent a sudden conversion to theosophy. It conveniently awoke him to all his previous lives and gave him the ability to re recite any verse of the various sacred texts on demand. He offered to help edit the secret doctrine, but found it to be impossibly flawed. It was so diffuse, diffuse and, and chaotic, uh, so he walked away from that project. He lived only for 34 years, but his intensity and his exacting mind that he meant that he earned his place in the pantheon of notable theosophists, especially as he was the first Hindu and played a multi-level part in the TS being accepted through all the castes and sects without the corruption that Olcott seeded into Buddhism, which is a whole other talk for a whole other day. Jump forward to 1953, because, as I say, London Lodge is new, it's bright, it's shiny. They, they had branches before, and when um, Olcott had been on holiday in Scotland, he'd gone to Edinburgh and said, oh, no, 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 don't, don't have a secret um, branch anymore. Become a lodge so more people can see what we're about and spread the word and gain members and open it up. That was his whole thing. And so the London Lodge was quite a bold step in lots of ways, but as I say, it was riven from the beginning. So in 1953, the indefatigable Clara Claude published her Theosophy as the Masters See It and devoted 191 pages to lodge work. She begins by saying that the first great point to be noted is, as the majority of us have found out, that persons are the most valuable asset. The level of the Lodge's work and influence is dependent on the personality of its members, their character, purity of motive, unselfishness and capacity. Most particularly, is this the case with its officers and leaders? And hence the master whom he says, the usefulness of the branch, very likely if not entirely, depends on the loyalty, discretion and zeal of its president and secretary. However much their colleagues may do to assist them, the efficient activity of their group in, in, envelops proportionately with, those, with that of those officers. Well, I don't know what the TS was like in 1953, but she, they could have done with that in 1883, that's for sure. Miss Codd then uh, cites when she gets on to her next section, which is need, the need for discretion. Vital in anyone who assumes responsibility, mischief arises from people who don't use it. They have A, a want of mental capacity, B, a want of control of speech. It is still the case everywhere, I find, really. So, 
Spirituality is, and the possession of psychic powers are not synonymous, as we all know. And we see so many people putting on the holy act these days as they do tarot cards or a bit of healing or whatever it is. And they're neither psychic nor spiritual, but they're paying the mortgage, so it's fine. <laughs> Spiritualism was predicated on the supposition that a person's spirit was contactable after death. Egoists rather liked the idea then, especially if they felt they had something of importance to say and a willing collaborator, a collaborator to sit in anticipation of their continuance, like Anna and Edward. Sinnott and the other theosophists loathed the dense materialism of the Victorian age that denied, ignored or scorned the ideas of anything but the outer physical world existing, let alone being valid. The scientists were very often uncomfortable Christians, but didn't leave the respectability of the Church of England because it, their findings, their inventions, were not Bible-based. They, they didn't have words to describe the importance of what they were doing half the time. They had to invent names for what they'd just done. You know, this whole world of brass cogs and stuff, it was very, very exciting. And, but they didn't know which ideas were great and would fly. You know, the whole Tesla... Uh, electricity thing is the obvious thing to come to mind there. Spiritualism was a popular movement and as people had, were so much closer to their death 150 years ago, as I said, they, 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 they did, did give a great deal of comfort to an awful lot of people. Churches and charismatic leaders led all sorts of movements, offering all sorts of ways to a better life, both here and in the hereafter. And we cannot comprehend other than on a personal level, the terrible, terrible anguish that we've been in every street, every, every, all the time, really. Misery abounded, and the spiritualists gave true or false proof of the body having stopped, but the spirit living on. Theosophy thought this was wrong. Why try to keep someone's soul earthbound when it could go off on the huge adventure of the higher planes? Why poke around in the murk of the astral plane where cast off lower principles of former men and women helped by certain elementals to use the vital forces of the medium masquerading as the personalities of such departed friends as the persons assisting in the seances desired to invoke, often to the damaging of the mental and physical health of the medium? Again, Depends on training, depends how you do it, depends on your integrity. They, you know, they're, they're, a lot of good can be done from it, but if it's the only thing you do, it's a bit like only eating apples. You know, it gets boring and doesn't really do you any good in the end. Spiritualists tended not to believe in reincarnation, but the soul ascended ever upwards, the personality intact. The philosophy, theosophists believed in multiple, mutable personalities evolving. They both had the belief in the perfection of man. Colonel Olcott met Anna for the first time when she was up for re-election a couple of years after her uh, time as president and she had decided not to stand. And he offered her a charter for the Hermetic Theosophical Society with a view to it was expedient. She was popular, she was autocratic, but she had stuff to say. She had followers around her. She was very sick. She shouldn't have stood in the first place. She was even sicker now. And so rather than say, you've driven us absolutely up the bloody wall and you've been so divisive and so difficult, we want nothing more to do with you. He very pragmatically said, well, we'll issue you a charter for your own lodge and then Sinnott will step back into the London Lodge. And he offered her the charter for the Hermetic Theosophical Society. She left the leader, Anna Kingsford left the leadership of the TS in the spring 1884 and at once set up the Hermetic Society. She mixed her own version of feminism, Renaissance magic, Eastern mysticism and Gnosticism with Christianity. Finally, she was in her own spotlight. She led, not shared, at last, as she wasn't proselytising to people with an established and eager, and eager belief in theosophy, but they joined the Hermetic Society <coughs> because they wanted to know what she had to say. Men were told that they had no chance of knowing the full invitation, intuition of God unless they exalted the woman in themselves. Which, again, the makeup of that society, I don't know if anyone's done any, any stats on it, it would be very interesting to see if it was predominantly women in that society, or whether the men earnestly, you know, tried to um, find the woman within themselves. 
This woman messiah had broken free of any recognisable shackles and wasted no time in dismissing Blavatsky as an occultist, not a mix mystic. She meant it quite rudely, or she could have been not dismissing her, but rather identifying with her, as in the Hermetic Society, occultism was in, mysticism was out. It, the, the way it's written, it's hard to tell. Anna harnessed her energies against Louis Pasteur and the other vivisectionists. When Professor Paul Burt, one of the Parisian vivisectionists, died, she made some very, very ugly entries in her diary, which weren't known about until Maitland published them some years later. She said, For months I've been working to compass the death of Paul Burt and have just succeeded. But I have succeeded. The demonstration of the power is complete. The will can and does kill. Paul Burt was wasted to death. Now only one remains on hand, Pasteur, who is certainly doomed and must, I should think, succumb in the few months to, at the utmost. Oh, how I've longed for these war words, more de Monsieur Paul Burt. And now, and now, they actually are gazing at me as if it was in the first column of the Figaro, complimenting, congratulating, felicitating me. I have killed Paul Burt, as I will kill Louis Pasteur, and after him the whole tribe of vivisectors if I live long enough. Courage. It's a magnificent power to have, and one that transcends all vulgar methods of delinquent dealing out justice by tyrants. That's November 19, 1886. That's proper nasty, that is. I'm surprised, considering he burnt so much stuff, he didn't just gently lose that paper as well. That's not a nice thing that you want your friend, your helpmeet, the person to whom you've devoted 30, 40 years of your life to, live and dead. You don't want that around their shoulders, surely. Quite bizarre. In her diary of a year before, in November 1885, she said that through all her previous incarnations, she had been driven by the desire for greatness, the desire to achieve. The diary was private, and when the Golden Dawn started up, they were quite sensibly impressed by Anna Kingsford. She, Besant and Blavatsky were great role models for the women attracted to the overtly magical order. And they were enormously empowering, as we would now say, and the neophytes that felt that they could realise their full potential, as all teachers seem to say, um, and work with men as equals. Again, fabulous. They used to turn up in evening dresses to Theosophical Society meetings. They, they used to d d turn up in evening dresses to um, co-Masonic groups, of which I the one I belong to did that for many, many years. Um, it was still very strict on dress code, actually. But... Um, this was, this was you know, quite different. The women's clothing reform movement and the success of the pre-Raphaelites had got into the magic circle, into the, lot, into the magic lodge, and they wore the same robes. And when you had your hood up, people couldn't tell who you were, and they couldn't, they, well, they could always, really, but the idea was that you couldn't be told. You assumed the role of irrespective of male or female, unless it was a specifically a male or female role. One of the founders of the Golden Dawn, Wim Westcott, referred to her as indeed illumined by the sun of light. Him, Samuel McGregor Mathers, had lectured for the Hermetic Society, as was said earlier. Her belief in an active will in mysticism and admonishments against passive mediumship, it is thought led to the wording of the original Golden Dawn neophyte obligation. This statement, being made by women, even solidly middle-class, well-educated ones, was as radical as birth control. I will not suffer myself to be hypnotised, nor mesmerised, nor will I place myself in such a passive state that any uninitiated person, power or being may cause me to lose control of my thoughts, words or actions. Fabulous. Alistair Crowley, the enfant terrible of the Golden Dawn, and the, <laughs> the, 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 the middle-aged man terrible of almost every other situation in his life, said in his Magic in Theory and Practice in 1929 that Anna Kingsford had done more in the religious world than any other person had done for generations. And without theosophy, the worldwide interest in similar matters would never have been aroused. He said also that she was disposed of an initiating force sufficient to transfigure the thought of half the world. She was doubtless the head of a battering ram that broke in the gates of the materialist philosophy of the Victorian age. 
Praise indeed. He liked clever women, Crowley. Um, and she, he obviously, you know, liked her ruthlessness to some extent, I think. Such was her confidence in her visionary writings that she wrote that the vision of Adonai, enclosed with the sun, was not to be changed in so much as a single word, an idea that Crowley then copied when he received the Book of the Law from a discarnate entity in 1904, and, and that's still respected today. His messianic, her messianic writings mind matched his. He identified, she identified with the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and 12 stars surrounding her. Crowley obviously did study her works before he appropriated parts of them, as he also identified with the great beast from the book of Revelation. The um, woman clothed with the sun was from there. Um, and he was no stranger to the abomination of desolation, which she wrote about, and was very keen on the procession of the equinoxes. So how did she get such ugly and extreme thoughts? In the autumn of 1886, HPB wrote to her dear Mr. Sinnett, Lane Fox wants to come and see me, and please keep it confidential. Mrs. Anna Kingsford wants to come and see me, and ask me now at least to place her in communication with the masters. Five exclamation marks for that. She didn't bother while she was head president. She, she wants it now, though. I feel unable to do justice to my feelings. By March 1986... Anna Kingsford and a couple of others had been possessed of bad influences. They attributed these persecutions to having had some contact with Madame B and the Mahatmas. But as ever, the sensible answer to that was that in working with the TS, people place themselves under the protection of the masters, and all goes well as long as we believe in them. But from the day when the insidious doubts creep into our minds, the protections of the masters are withdrawn. The ousting of Anna Kingsford as president of the London Lodge by Alfred Sinnott was because of her criticisms of his esoteric Buddhism. It was, however, a short-lived victory, as when HPB settled in London in 1887, he, she established the Blavatsky Lodge, and everyone who wanted to sit at the feet of the mistress and hear their philosophy, theosophy from the source, and the London Lodge attendants fell away sharply after this battle royal they'd had. He criticised her publicly when she set up the esoteric section that promised the select group would hear her and experience things not suitable for the general membership. They had to pledge obedience to HPB. He said that it sinned against the fundamental principles of theosophy. She retaliated by criticising sections of esoteric Buddhism in the secret doctrine. So she sunk to their level in the end, really. Should Anna Kingsford have been elected to the presidency of the London Lodge? Well, overall, I think so, because she was autocratic, clever, a doer, and initially had the backing of the hierarchy. She was no better and no worse than her fellow members at backbiting, being contentious, and all too unaware that the contact with the masters has to be earned, respected, and could be withdrawn. She was youngish, vain, and had great style, and then as now, that is all too often lacking. She also had charisma. Her illness was a long one and bravely born, as they say. That spurred on an already driven woman. Her life's work was varied and valuable. Her causes were all laudable and far more important than her own belief that she was the one vo true voice that should shout about them. It's a luxury to know so much about writers and campaigners and it lets us sit in judgment of them. We should judge them by their public actions and their writing. And because of that, I salute the endeavours of Anna Kingsford. But what does it matter what we think? It was, the decision was made by the Chohans. And they also said they wanted her because she opened the Western esoteric theosophical teachings. And so it made more sense to everybody in the West. It stopped it being an Eastern body. She opened it out now. We're talking, we would have had to learn Hindi or something time, once upon a time. We, we, have, we are Westerners in London, and we continue that work, and they had decided that the society was ready for that. It eliminated the latent racism, or even overt racism, that might have given some Londoners um, reservations about joining. She made the Theosophical Society a Western society, and it was mature enough to need that before it was 20 years old. Thank you. <laughs>